Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, I'm gonna to do a watercolor painting in a limited palette. This palette is going to be the Zorn palette. Uh, first, I'm gonna saturate my paper with water, and then I'll talk about the colors and the idea behind it. So I'm using a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, 140 pound cold press. All right, so I've been playing with limited palettes and somebody had recommended and suggested utilizing the Zorn palette. I played around with the Zorn palette a few years ago and I recently did a few videos in watercolor with the modified Zorn palette. And the Zorn palette is mainly used for portraits and figures. So I'm gonna attempt a landscape painting in it. Pretty much what it is, it's yellow ochre, and originally this palette was also meant for oil painting. I believe the painter was Anders Zorn that it's attributed to. I don't think he solely painted in this palette, um, but I think there were some other colors added in at times, but I think this was the basis of it. So yellow ochre, vermilion. If you don't have vermilion, you can use uh, a cadmium light, uh, the U, or I guess real cadmium if you have it. Um, you can also use, I think I've read some people are using Venetian red as a replacement for vermilion. Next, I have Payne's Gray. The original palette, I believe, was is lamp black or ivory black? Let me know in the comments below if you know which one it was. Um, I'm using Payne's Gray as this I had found as a recommendation for the palette on Jane Blundell's page. She utilized Jane's Gray, which is her combination of ultramarine and burnt sienna. Now, Payne's Gray, I believe this is a black and a blue mixed. Most brands seem to do that. I think um, that'll give some interest, and it plays the part of a blue within the original palette. And the original palette had a white. I took out titanium buff. Um, I think from this point on, after this video, I'll probably play with the white gouache, because the titanium buff just uh, doesn't seem to cut it. I mean, white and watercolor... It's difficult, and I was trying to maintain as close to not using gouache as possible. And it kind of has a cream color. It's a really nice color. And we'll see how it works with this. And when I did my portrait experiments with it earlier this week, I utilized my cap doesn't want to close. Bleed proof white at the end. So essentially, I did kind of rely on a gouache at the end of um, those paintings. Anywho, so we'll see what happens. We'll talk about the palette as we paint. Uh, my expectations aren't that high, which is probably good. That means I'll be excited about the results if we have anything close to a landscape. I'm not going to paint from a photograph um, it's going to be an imaginary scene. You're welcome to paint along. I think I offered quite a bit of alternatives for the colors if you don't have those. I'm going to use the Hake brush. We're probably going to go with the yellow ochre. Usually, usually when I paint, I'll use raw sienna. Yellow ochre is going to be a little bit more opaque. But... We'll use it for our sky and to kind of map out the painting. This is a medium Ron Ranson Hake brush. It is very aged. I've been using it for over three years. So even if you had the exact same brand, uh, people were commenting that they could hear the difference in the video with just how it uh, interacts with the paper compared to their Hake brush. This one's just 
stiffened, worn, and very well used. We'll grab some um, Buff Titan. A little bit of Payne's Gray got on there. It's such a subtle color that it might find its way later on in the painting as an accent piece. In the um, oil painting palette, it was used for mixing um, by simply mixing white with the black, you would get the illusion of um, blue. Let's grab some vermilion. I feel like this will be good sky color. I'm almost thinking if this palette was going to be utilized often or kind of put in a bag of tricks for landscape painting, maybe if you keep kept in mind a very hot summery beach um, maybe the Mediterranean area if you read about Turner they'll say that his colors and I think his palette had changed after he visited um, I guess it was Italy and I think it was very inspired by the warmer colors at that loca locale So we kind of get that feel to it, and in fact, mixing it with the yellow ochre almost gives that earth red. Now, of course, I, I mentioned that I have the synthetic vermilion, so it might be those mixing within it. Let's grab some Payne's Gray. We'll put that in the sky. Now, I'll put large quantities in. The Payne's Gray is going to soften some and lighten up, but in the interest of just exploring the palette in a fast and loose style, we'll see what happens. And I do feel like the um, buff Titan is still present on the brush, I haven't washed anything off. So that might be kind of an issue where Whenever you use gouache with watercolor, I use a separate palette or I have a separate container when I use gouache just because of its tendency to be chalky and um, contaminate the rest of the palette. And that's how I feel here. So this is the Payne's Gray with whatever's on the brush. Let's do Payne's Gray and the Vermilion. Here we're going to have a warmer color. When I would play with this palette and gouache a few years ago, I would add burnt umber, but you can get a kind of burnt umbery effect with the mixture of the Payne's Gray, black, and the Vermilion. Whatever you so choose. We're going to have to put in trees to explore the highlight possibilities of the buff titan. I do want to grab a little bit of yellow ochre first in this mix. The yellow ochre and the black, sorry, the Payne's Gray, black in the original palette, Payne's Gray here, is going to give you a push towards a green. If I remember correctly, the only thing that the palette really can't really approach is maybe purples, but um, I believe purples were shown in an oil painting video by a young gentleman. I can't remember his name. 
he, he paints portraits and oils on YouTube and he explored the Zorn palette and had some purples which would make sense uh, if you looked at the vermilion and the black or Payne's gray from that standpoint Put little accents back here. I think these sweeping effects are effects of the um, Buff Titan. Let's go wet and wet in the sky. We'll start forming a tree. Since we're still wet, it'll soften and diffuse. And then we'll come back over when it's dry and we'll get our um, depth effect. So just a cheap, easy way to create depth in trees. Just to, um, to reiterate what I had just said. Um, so the wet and wet, when we diffuse it, and it's going to soften, then coming back over with sharper brush strokes, uh, the dry brush, we have that softness, we have that harshness. The softness gives the effect of the further foliage, all the, the heart. You have softness further, harsher, closer. All right, so I am going to go out on a limb, pun intended, while we're painting trees. This is uh, Payne's Gray, darken up the shadows here. I am liking the results so far. Like I said, my expectations weren't that high, but I do think for fast and loose painting, it has potential. There's so many different minimalistic palettes that you can utilize that you can either start setting up um, different palettes of them and have them at the ready or find scenes and feels that you like and what you attribute it towards. Oh man, I don't know if this shows up on the camera, but that swirling texture that's happening here is really, really cool. I don't even want to touch anything in there. And I think that's just the Buff Titan interacting. I grabbed a little Buff Titan just to see if we can get something to happen here with it. Let's grab a bit of vermilion. Now, a few things on white in watercolor painting. There are watercolor purists who will say that um, white doesn't belong in watercolor painting. And you know, everybody is entitled to their own opinion. Um, at the end of the day, for you watching, I want you guys to make your own decision either way on if you want white within it or not. Um, to give you a little backstory, I'm taking the credit card, the sharp edge, to scrape some trunks in while I ramble. During the Victorian era, the 1800s, I believe that's when gouache and white gouache was introduced. I was reading this on handprint.com a while ago. Handprint is a rabbit hole of watercolor and pigment information that you really just don't want to go down. It's just way, it's very technical. The guy is absolutely fantastic in his research, but 
it can become very overwhelming and distracting from actual painting. Anyway, he had this very interesting tidbit that during the 1800s, you just had so many people starting to paint as a hobby. And you had to have some sort of way to separate the masters from the amateurs. And they had art critics come out, people writing books, putting out statements. And one of the ideas was that, um, that, that white did not belong in watercolor. I believe they felt that it um, kind of bridged the gap too much between oils and watercolor and started giving that effect. So that's kind of the origin behind it. Uh, some old people in the 1800s having their say in it. So from that, take it what you will. I mean, you can form your own opinion aesthetically if you think that it belongs in it or not. Experiment with it or not. Have fun. I think um, some people nowadays, especially teachers, are concerned about uh, black and white on palettes and watercolor as it becomes too much of a uh, crutch where a student might utilize that as opposed to mixing their darks. This is the number one rigger. And I'm grabbing some Payne's Gray. I'm just starting to put in some uh, trunks and branches. We're still wet and wet. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Obviously, I, I would recommend exploring mixing your darks from um, your ultramarine and your burnt sienna, your burnt umber, uh, and playing around, seeing what is possible with the palette. Some people say that mixing with black uh, deadens the color. But once again, you're the one painting and it's up to you. The only time think anybody should really have any say into it unless, unless you have a teacher you know somebody that you're you know, taking a class with and that's giving you instructions and if not then you know don't go to that teacher but you know I mean I guess you know respect what they're you know trying to convey and at least uh, see what their viewpoint is to there uh, or if you do any sort of competition I think competitions will have very strict regulations on if you can use certain pigments or not, you know, white or black. I've never done an art competition before. I, I don't know if I ever would. Anyway, um, you can see how we're wet and wet, how it's diffusing. We can get variations on what we're putting in here. This is the yellow ochre and the Payne's gray. If we want to start getting our green colors in, we can do a little more scraping and a little bit drying off. I don't even want to really scrape in that area. I like that subtle texture that happened. Pull some out, a little more out here. You can pull out a little bit of rock edge. Before we do the dry off and observe how things lighten up, I will do the little spiel of, you know, you're always welcome to follow along with anything that I paint. You're welcome to sign your own name to it. In fact, I encourage you to. And if you want to go ahead and sell anything that you do after you follow one of these videos, these tutorials, you have my express permission to do that. I want you all to be successful and you know art supplies are expensive. That being said, if you'd like to support this channel, I have a whole bunch of ways down below. I have the Patreon, I do have exclusive content on there. Liking and subscribing helps. I also have the Etsy account. 
After this, I'm going to photograph some recent paintings and upload to Etsy. So, you know, check that out. This is the Payne's Gray. Went on a little bit thicker. We didn't do a dry off, but it is working pretty well right now. Alright, so let's see how everything softens as it gets dry, uh, dried. Alright, I believe that's dried enough. And surprisingly, we didn't have much of a tonal shift. Um, so now I'm going to go back in with, I had planned on darkening up quite a bit, but it, it, it really survived the drying well. I'm very uh, surprised and kind of shocked, uh, especially the paint's gray. So I'm going to do the dry brush over this soft foliage and the purpose of this is to give a sense of depth where we have some closer leaves. While I was drying off, I will say that, and, and this isn't a full exploration of the palette within landscapes, but Payne's Gray and Yellow Ochre make a great natural green feel. That's what I'm starting to put in now. So that's that's a winning mix right there. And I don't know if it was the buff Titan or the yellow ochre mixed with the vermilion, giving that really soft background right there. And the sky, that worked well. Very pleased with a few... Um, of the results so far. I believe initially I had thought about using some bleed proof white at the very end. With the state that the painting is in, I am going to admit I'm not going to use that. Um, I'll admit that so that we'll stay purely within watercolor so nobody can say the bleed proof white was on the gouache side. Let's put out some from the tube buff Titan. And I think it's short for, yeah, it's Titan buff. I think it's short for um, like buffered, where it's a mix to get the effect. But uh, in oils, believe I have it in oils. Um, Williamsburg paint does an unbleached titanium. I think that's the uh, origin of that. We'll put this in and see how it accents. I've used it maybe a few years ago as an accent piece within watercolor. I haven't really used it that often. And with such a light background, if there's areas that you had wanted to essentially fix up, you could do that. You can dot in some flowers, little wildflowers to stand out against what's already there. Probably grab the hake. speed the process up. Okay. A little bit of interest. Grab the number four rigger just for your few uh thicker trunks and you know this is in the interest of time 
and YouTube video length. I know when they get on the longer side, they get um, a little daunting. So what we'll do is we'll grab, oh, you know what we'll do? Titan buff for our birds. It doesn't wash off the brush well. And I'm going to try not to hit the exact area with it, but a little bit of Payne's Gray to accent the birds. And there you have it. So, modified Zorn palette in watercolor. It it works. It works for fast and loose painting. Uh, let's do a dry off and we'll sign it. Uh, while it's drying, I noticed that the camera was a little out of focus. So hopefully it wasn't out of focus when I was painting. Um, that being said, I sure you can hear the surprise in my voice. Um, pleasantly surprised with this very simple four color combination uh, originally meant for portraits and figures in landscape. I hope you enjoyed. Please like, subscribe, follow. Uh, let me know in the comments what you all would like to see uh, for future videos. I am on holiday break, on Christmas break. So I have two weeks of art, fun, every day. So I'll talk to you all soon and take care. Bye-bye.